Chapter 8 of The Ghost, A Modern Fantasy by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 8. The Message. When I returned to Alresca's house, or rather I should say to my own house, after the moving and picturesque ceremony of the funeral, I found a note from Rosetta Rosa, asking me to call on her at the Hotel du Commerce. This was the first news of her that I had had since she so abruptly quitted the scene of Alresca's death. I set off instantly for the hotel, and, just as I was going, I met my Anglo-Belgian lawyer, who presented to me a large envelope addressed to myself in the handwriting of Alresca, and marked private. The lawyer, who had been engaged in the sorting and examination of an enormous quantity of miscellaneous papers left by Alresca, informed me that he only discovered the package that very afternoon. I took the packet, put it in my pocket, and continued on my way to Rosa. It did not occur to me at the time, but it occurred to me afterwards, that I was extremely anxious to see her again. Everyone who has been to Bruges knows the Hôtel du Commerce. It is the Ritz of Bruges, and very well aware of its own importance in the scheme of things. As I entered the courtyard, a waiter came up to me. Excuse me, monsieur, but we have no rooms. Why do you tell me that? Oh, pardon, I thought monsieur wanted a room. Mademoiselle Rosa, the great diva, is staying here, and all the English from the Hôtel du Panier d'Or have left there in order to be in the same hotel with Mademoiselle Rosa. Somewhere behind that mask of professional civility there was a smile. I do not want a room, I said, but I wanted to see Mademoiselle Rosa. Ah, as to that, monsieur, I would inquire. He became stony at once. Stay, take my card. He accepted it, but with an air which implied that everyone left a card. In a moment another servant came forth, breathing apologies, and led me to Rosa's private sitting-room. As I went in, a youngish, dark-haired, black-aproned woman, who I had no doubt was Rosa's maid, left the room. Rosa and I shook hands in silence and with a little diffidence. Wrapped in a soft, black, thin-textured tea-gown, she reclined in an easy chair. Her beautiful face was a dead white, her eyes were dilated, and under them were dark semicircles. "'You have been ill,' I exclaimed, and I was not told. She shrugged her shoulders in denial, and shivered. "'No,' she said shortly. There was a pause. "'He is buried?' "'Yes.' "'Let me hear about it.' I wished to question her further about her health, but her tone was almost imperious, and I had a curious fear of offending her. Nevertheless, I reminded myself that I was a doctor, and my concern for her urged me to be persistent. But surely you have been ill, I said. She tapped her foot. It was the first symptom of nervous impatience that I had observed in her. Not in body, she replied curtly. Tell me all about the funeral and I gave her an account of the impressive incidents of the interment, the stately procession, the grandiose ritual, the symbols of public grief. She displayed a strange, morbid curiosity as to it all. And then suddenly she rose up from her chair, and I rose also, and she demanded, as it were pushed by some secret force, to the limit of her endurance. You loved him, didn't you, Mr. Foster? It was not an English phrase. No Englishwoman would have used it. I was tremendously fond of him, I answered. I should never have thought that I could have grown so fond of anyone in such a short time. He wasn't merely fine as an artist. He was so fine as a man. She nodded. You understood him? You knew all about him? He talked to you openly, didn't he? Yes, I said. He used to tell me all kinds of things. Then explain to me, she cried out, and I saw that tears brimmed in her eyes. Why did he die when I came? It was a coincidence, I said lamely. Seizing my hands, she actually fell on her knees before me, flashing into my eyes all the loveliness of her pallid, upturned face. It was not a coincidence, she passionately sobbed. Why can't you be frank with me and tell me how it is that I have killed him? He said long ago, do you not remember, that I was fatal to him? He was getting better, you yourself said so, till I came. And then he died. What could I reply? The girl was uttering the thoughts which had haunted me for days. 
I tried to smile a reassurance, and, raising her as gently as I could, I led her back to her chair. It was on my part a feeble performance. You are suffering from a nervous crisis, I said, and I must prescribe for you. My first prescription is that we do not talk about Alreska's death. I endeavoured to be perfectly matter-of-fact in tone, and gradually she grew calmer. I have not slept since that night, she murmured wearily. Then you will not tell me? What have I to tell you except that you are ill? Stop a moment. I have an item of news. After all, poor Oreska has made me his heir. That was like his kind heart. Yes, indeed, but I can't imagine why he did it. It was just gratitude, said she. A rare kind of gratitude, I replied. Is no reason given in the will? Not a word. I remembered the packet which I had just received from the lawyer, and I mentioned it to her. Open it now, she said. I am interested, if you do not think me too inquisitive. I tore the envelope. It contained another envelope, sealed, and a letter. I scanned the letter. It's nothing, I said with false casualness, and was returning it to my pocket. The worst of me is that I have no histrionic instinct. I cannot act a part. Wait, she cried sharply, and I hesitated before the appeal in her tragic voice. You cannot deceive me, Mr. Foster. It is something. I entreat you to read to me that letter. Does it not occur to you that I have the right to demand this from you? Why should he beat about the bush? You know, and I know that you know, that there is a mystery in this dreadful death. Be frank with me, my friend. I have suffered much these last days. We looked at each other silently, I with the letter in my hand. Why indeed should I treat her as a child, this woman with the compelling eyes, the firm, commanding forehead? Why should I pursue the silly game of pretense? I will read it, I said. There is certainly a mystery in connection with Aureska's death, and we may be on the eve of solving it. The letter was dated concurrently with Aureska's will, that is to say, a few days before our arrival in Bruges, and it ran thus. My dear friend, it seems to me that I am to die, and from a strange cause, for I believe I have guessed the cause. The nature of my guess and all the circumstances I have written out at length and the document is in the sealed packet which accompanies this. My reason for making such a record is a peculiar one. I should desire that no eye might ever read that document. But I have an idea that some time or other record may be of use to you, possibly soon. You, Carl, may be the heir of more than my goods. If matters should so fall out, then break the seal and read what I have written. If not, I beg of you, after five years have elapsed, to destroy the packet unread. I do not care to be more precise. Always yours, Aureska. That is all? asked Rosa, when I had finished reading it. I passed her the letter to read for herself. Her hand shook as she returned it to me. And we both blushed. We were both confused, and each avoided the glance of the other. The silence between us was difficult to bear. I broke it. The question is, what am I to do? Araska is dead. Shall I respect his wish, or shall I open the packet now? If he could have foreseen your anxiety, he probably would not have made these conditions. Besides, who can say that the circumstances he hints at have not already arisen? Who can say? I uttered the words with an emphasis the daring of which astounded even myself. That I am not already the heir of more than Araska's goods. I imagined, after achieving this piece of audacity, that I was perfectly calm, but within me there must have raged such a tumult of love and dark foreboding that in reality I could scarcely have known what I was about. Rosa's eyes fixed themselves upon me, but I sustained that gaze. She stretched forth a hand as if to take the packet. You shall decide, I said. Am I to open it, or am I not to open it? Open it, she whispered. He will forgive us. I began to break the seal. No, no, she screamed, standing up again with clenched hands. I was wrong. Leave it for God's sake. I could not bear to know the truth. I, too, sprang up, electrified by that terrible outburst. Grasping tight the envelope, I walked to and fro in the room, stamping on the carpet, and wondering all the time, in one part of my brain, why I should be making such a noise with my feet. 
At length I faced her. She had not moved. She stood like a statue, her black tea-gown falling about her, and her two hands under her white-drawn face. It shall be as you wish, I said. I won't open it. And I put the envelope back into my pocket. We both sat down. Let us have some tea, eh? said Rosa. She had resumed her self-control more quickly than I could. I was unable to answer her matter-of-fact remark. She rang the bell, and the maid entered with tea. The girl's features struck me. They showed both wit and cunning. What splendid tea, I said, when the reflection was in progress. We both find it convenient to shelter our feelings behind small talk. I'd no idea you'd get tea like this in Bruges. You can't, Rosa smiled. I never travel without my own brand. It is one of Yvette's special cares not to forget it. Your maid? Yes. She seems not quite the ordinary maid, I ventured. Yvette? No, I should think not. She has served half the sopranos in Europe. She won't go to contratos. I possess her because I outbid all rivals for her services. As a hairdresser, she is unequalled. And it's so much nicer not being forced to call on a coiffure in every town. It was she who invented my Elsa coiffure. Perhaps you remember it. Perfectly. By the way, when do you recommence your engagements? She smiled nervously. I, I haven't decided. Nothing with any particle of significance passed during the remainder of our interview. Telling her that I was leaving for England the next day, I bade good-bye to Rosa. She did not express the hope of seeing me again, and for some obscure reason buried in the mysteries of love's psychology, I dared not express the hope to her. And so we parted, with a thousand things unsaid, on a note of ineffectuality, of suspense, of vague indefiniteness. And the next morning I received from her this brief missive, which threw me into a wild condition of joyous expectancy. If you could meet me in the church of St. Giles at eleven o'clock this morning, I should like to have your advice upon a certain matter. Rosa. Seventy-seven years elapsed before eleven o'clock. St. Giles is a large church in a small deserted square at the back of the town. I waited for Rosa in the western porch, and at five minutes past the hour she arrived, looking better in health, at once more composed and vivacious. We sat down in a corner at the far end of one of the aisles. Except ourselves and a couple of cleaners, there seemed to be no one in the church. You asked me yesterday about my engagements, she began. Yes, I said, and I had a reason. As a doctor, I will take leave to tell you that it is advisable for you to throw yourself into your work as soon as possible and as completely as possible. And I remember the similar advice which, out of the plenitude of my youthful wisdom, I had offered to, to Areska only a few days before. The fact is that I have signed a contract to sing Carmen at the Palais Opera Comique in a fortnight's time. I have never sung the role there before, and I am, or rather I was, very anxious to do so. This morning I had a telegram for the manager urging me to go to Paris without delay for the rehearsals. And are you going? That is the question. I may tell you that one of my objects in calling on Paul Areska was to consult him about the point. The truth is... I am threatened with trouble if I appear at the Opera Comique, particularly in Carmen. The whole matter is paltry beyond words, but really I am a little afraid. May I hear the story? You know Carlotta Deschamps, who always takes Carmen at the Comique? I have heard her sing. By the way, that is her half-sister, Marie Deschamps, who sings in your cousin's operas at the London Diana. I have made the acquaintance of Marie. Harmless little thing. Her half-sister isn't quite so harmless. She is the daughter of a Spanish mother, while Marie is the daughter of an English mother, a Cockney woman. As to Carlotta, when I was younger... Oh, the deliciously aged air with which this creature of twenty-three referred to her youth. I was singing at the Opera Comique in Paris, where Carlotta was starring, and I had the misfortune to arouse her jealousy. She is frightfully jealous, and gets worse as she gets older. She swore to me that if I ever dared to appear at the comic again, she would have me killed. I laughed. I forgot the affair, but it happens that I never have sung at the comic since that time. And now that I am not merely to appear at the comic, but I am going to sing Carmen there, her own particular role, 
Touchon is furious. I firmly believe she means harm. Twice she has written to me the most formidable threats. It seems strange that I should stand in awe of a woman like Carlotta Deschamps, but so it is. I am half inclined to throw up the engagement. That a girl of Rosa's spirit should have hesitated for an instant about fulfilling her engagement showed most plainly, I thought, that she was not herself. I assured her that her fears were groundless, that we lived in the nineteenth century, and that Deschamps' fury would spend itself in nothing worse than threats. In the end, she said she would reconsider the matter. Don't wait to reconsider, I urged, but set off for Paris at once. Go today. Act. It will do you good. But there are a hundred things to be thought of first, she said, laughing at my earnestness. For example, well, my jewels are with my London bankers. Can't you sing without jewels? Not in Paris. Who ever heard of such a thing? You can write to your bankers to send them my registered post. Post? There were thousands and thousands of pounds. I ought really to fetch them, but there would scarcely be time. Let me bring them to you in Paris, I said. Give me a letter to your bankers, and I will undertake to deliver the jewels safely into your hands. I could not dream of putting you to so much trouble. The notion of doing something for her had, however, laid hold of me. At that moment I felt that to serve even as her jewel carrier would be for me the supreme happiness in the world. But, I said, I asked it as a favour. Do you? She gave me a divine smile and yielded. At her request we did not leave the church together. She preceded me. I waited a few minutes and then walked slowly out. Happening to look back as I passed along the square, I saw a woman's figure which was familiar to me, and, dominated by a sudden impulse, I returned quickly on my steps. The woman was Yvette, and she was obviously a little startled when I approached her. Are you waiting for your mistress? I said sharply, because... She flashed me a look. Did Monsieur by any chance imagine that I was waiting for himself? There was a calm insolence about the girl which induced me to retire from that parley. In two hours, I was on my way to London. End of chapter 8